Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Hey church, happy Palm Sunday. We just wrapped up our service here in Pakistan. Thank you so much for sending us. God bless all of you. It's been an amazing experience. I know it's changed my life and we'll be there uh, we'll be there next week to tell you all about it. See you on Easter Sunday. is a miracle so you pray always for cry of delivering ministry because we go to different nations that other people don't want to go they are going to plan to shut down the road tomorrow so they can accommodate more than 30,000 so let's pray for soul sigh wonder and miracle amen, amen. We're going to go right into the word if you could grab your bibles and go to Zechariah chapter 9 Verse 9, and you said, Pastor Pete, you were talking about Palm Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. How many of you got your palm branches? Wave them high. Wave them high. Now, how many of you took Brother Davy Hayes serious when he said he just cut his grass yesterday, and this is what you got? And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm looking at the tip, and all I can think of is 4th of July, peel and corn, you know, for a barbecue. But... I don't know what size corn would have a, uh, leaves like this, but I'm very thankful for these palm branches. We are going to talk about Palm Sunday, but I want to kick us off in uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. If you're there, get ready to read. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Ooh, I like that. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The title of my message today is, it wasn't what I thought it was. It's not what I think it is or what I wanted. Have you ever had that where it's not what you want? You're expecting something, you get it, you get excited, and it's not what you thought it would be. I can tell you, that when I got on my bike, I was not expecting to snap the derailleur off of it. I can also tell you that uh, last night, for whatever reason, I'm sitting there. My mother gave me a, uh, called me, and I'm talking to her on the phone. And for whatever reason, I thought it was Sunday night, not Saturday night. And can I be real with you? I got up this morning. Lord, help me. I got up this morning and I looked at my alarm and I said, oh, I have to get up. I have to get up. We got to get the kids ready for school because it's Monday morning. So pastor may be nine hours ahead, but I'm a full day off at this point. And then I realized because nobody else was up, because usually I'm one of the last ones up, uh, that it's Sunday morning. And that's why my alarm went off first. So I got up, got ready. But... When you read this, it sounds so exciting. Rejoice. Shout in triumph. Your king is coming. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's humble. Riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. You know, in, on Palm Sunday, we hear the story about Jesus riding on a donkey or riding on a donkey's colt. And I always, for whatever reason in my head, thought, 
Okay, so he rode on a donkey. Now, when I think of kings, when I think of people who are, are, are big, important folks, I think of the horses. You know, I remember, how many of you remember the, the cartoon Aladdin that came out, Disney put out years ago? And uh, uh, I remember thinking when he was trying to become this prince, they went from like a horse to a camel to an elephant, right? So they changed to an elephant because that's majestic and it's huge and the king can be seen. And you'd see some, if you watch uh, movies about different time periods, you'll see where even people carried the, the carriage of the king or the princess or the prince or whatever it is. The, as important as you were, a donkey was never something used to describe a king. Now, one of the things that looking through history and th as I was researching uh, this story and trying to dive into historical context, because one of the issues I always see um, is, is too often we look at the Word of God and we don't really go, oh, okay. Like when I read something and it says um, he's on a donkey's colt and I'm like, why wouldn't he be in a car? Well, because they didn't have cars. Oh, that's right. You know, it's one of those things you want the historical context so that you understand. And one of the things I found over and over and over again in any biblical text was that donkeys were actually reserved for kings. And I thought, no, they ride on big horses, you know, the ones that are ornately done and they clip clop in and all. No, the more and more I read, the more and more I dove into it, donkeys were actually reserved for kings when they were in a ceremonial way of doing things. Now, horses were reserved a lot for uh, pulling chariots. They were reserved for war and battle time because of their speed and strength. But a donkey was often used for royalty. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Okay, so, you know, he's on, a, he's on a donkey. I get that. Can you imagine? Because for me, I'm like, they might as well have said in today's t terms, Jesus is going to come and he's going to be riding in a smart car. Can you imagine that? Popping up the roof, he's standing there. Because, you know, they're so small. You're not, if you drive a smart car, I apologize. I'm not trying to offend you. I just think they, to me, they look like little roller skate cars. And just so that you're aware, I do fit in them. I've sat in them. They, I had to move the seat forward. It was quite impressive. But then I realized that there was a thin sheet of aluminum foil between me and every other vehicle on the road, and I was not as impressed. But you see, sometimes things don't turn out the way we want them to. Uh, years ago, I had the opportunity. I was part of a young adult group at our church, and um, they had an event they wanted us to go to. We were going to go tubing down the Shenandoah River. And now you have to understand, this is what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of tubing. I w uh, when I was 16, I got to go tubing down the Rio Grande River, which moved really fast and was a lot of fun. I also got to go tubing down the Guadalupe River. These are rivers in Texas. And that was a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, the Guadalupe River had uh, a area where they had dammed off the, the river and created a chute. So as you're moving, I mean, you just fly right through, it shoots you out. Anybody done that before? I'm the only, some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay, that's fine. Tubing to me was moving quickly on water. If you've ever been on a lake and you see somebody with a power boat and they've got a tube behind, that's tubing to me. Okay, it's fun, it's fast, it's exciting. Our young adult leader at the time apparently thought tubing meant like the lazy river at a water park. And he brings out all these tubes and we go to the river. It had not rained in a month. And we set the tubes in the water. And you know that you're in trouble when there's a ginormous inner tube and you sit there and the first thing you do is, ow! Because I sat on the tube, went in and hit the rocks on the bottom. As we're going down this river at the time, we were told it should take us no more than an hour. Two and a half hours in, three falls off of my tube. Don't ask how that happened. I still don't understand it either. I'm laying on my tube, literally baking in the sun, and I 
look to the side and I'm seeing these pipes come off the bank, little PVC pipes. And I lift my arm up out of the water to kind of turn and I see a ring around my arm of all the sludge in the river. Doesn't that just make you have a good time? And I wish I could tell you, oh, it was just like brown. No, it was that special brown-green combination with hints of blue. I don't know where the blue came from. I'm a little worried about that. Uh, I thought about getting checked out. You know, maybe I needed an extra shot or something. Because after being in this river floating for what then turned out to be three and a half hours, uh, just to share with you how low the river was, I had bought, you know, those little aqua socks, those water shoes, whatever those things are that you buy for little kids to be in the pool. And sometimes you buy them if you want to do like kayaking and stuff because it's like wearing a sock. I would call them water socks. They all laughed at me that day and were like, that's not what they're called. They're water shoes. And I'm like, okay, sure. I literally, after dragging my feet on the bottom, why did you drag your feet, Pastor Pete? Because I couldn't like you can only hold your legs up for so long. I literally ripped holes in the toes in the first 45 minutes of us going down down the river. I literally sat there while the current took us. I think really the river was just tilted down and we were just slowly moving that way because it did not move fast. It was not fun. I did not enjoy myself. Then I had sunburn. You ever had sunburn? to where you can't, like, move, that happens to me. I I burn very easily. I have to watch it. Um, I use SPF 3000 because it is intense. Uh, I have freckles all on my shoulders and my upper arms because when I was 15, I'd gotten second-degree burns from the sun. Didn't know you could do that. Thank you, UV rays. But I can tell you that it was not what I wanted. And I'm telling people the whole time, I'm an evangelist for how tubing should be. Listen, we need to move faster. We need to do this. We need to do that. We should have had a boat. I don't think a boat would have (laughs) made it in the water. As a matter of fact, we saw guys with, you know, those flat bottom boats for for, uh, fishing. There was a guy, literally, he passed us on the river going up. They had a little electric trolling motor. And the, there was a guy literally leaning over the front of the boat like this, watching for anything that would hinder the boat. And literally, he passed me, and about five minutes later, I hear this, sh- boom, and splash. And I turn around, and he wasn't standing at the front of the boat no more because they had hit a rock, and he went flying. Fortunately, he seemed to be okay, and... The way the current was moving, there was nothing I could do. I even, you ever do that where you start like trying to paddle if you're on a tube? You start moving your legs and arms. I tried doing that and I ended up turning in circles the whole way. It was miserable. It was not a fun event. It was not what I wanted. The funny thing is that happens to us a lot. That happens to us often where we don't get what we wanted. I had an idea and this was going to be so great and so wonderful. And it didn't turn out that way. You know, uh, I remember when my wife was pregnant with our first son, Trey, and I remember people saying about babies and how they wake up early sometimes. And I thought, and this is what I was told by several people, several of them, hey, You know, the 6 a.m. feeding's really not that bad. And they're right. It's the 2, 3, and 4 a.m. feedings that really get you. And I should have known, God tried to warn me. Because we were in uh, Babies R Us right after uh, we had found out about Hannah being pregnant. And we're the new parents who are like super excited, you know. (gasps) Let's look at cribs. I'd never been so excited to look at a crib. After about... 15 minutes in, I was not excited about looking at cribs anymore. Uh, but we were looking at all these things. What do we want? What? Look at this. Oh, and look at this stroller. And this stroller has a suspension. And this stroller has steering. And this stroller has four-wheel drive. And this stroller has, you know, an electric Tesla motor. No, it didn't have that. But there are so many weird things that you could look at. And I saw it. 
I saw it happen. This lady, the, this gentleman is standing in the aisle with the boxes of diapers with one of those round, the little kid's snack things. And he's just standing there, hunched over. His eyes are sunken in, black circles all around him. And he's just eating the little baby treats. And I walked by and I thought, oh no, what's wrong with that poor man? And about 10 minutes later, I walk by the aisle again and I see it. Buggy starts coming around the corner into that same aisle. And there's this young lady with big dark circles hunched over, walking like this as she approaches him. Honey, you ready to go? Hmm? And there was a six-month-old little baby strapped to her like this. <laughs> and God tried to warn me. He says, that will be you. And it was me for a few months, and then I got over it. You know, it's amazing how, you know, sleep deprivation is a form of torture in almost every single country on the planet. Uh, it's also a, t a thing used in all of our special forces groups to make sure they are prepared for battle. All they have to do is give them a baby. Training complete. And it's amazing how little sleep you really need to function but it's amazing how much you still miss said sleep to function. It's not what you wanted. Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Luke 19. I'm pretty sure I said 19. I may have said 9. I apologize. In verse 28. Now, I want to set the stage a little bit. This is Jesus' triumphant entry. He's just preached to a large group of people, and they're getting ready to enter Jerusalem. Now, in Matthew, they say something quite interesting. Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's getting ready to give them their commands for going out, okay, to get his cult. And you know what, we'll just go ahead and, and dive right in. Verse 28 says this, After telling this story, Jesus went towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage, Bethany, and the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. As you enter, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks why you're untying this colt, just say the Lord needs it. Now, I'm just letting you know, there are times where I'm going through the church and pastor will ask me to go get something and I love having that little card in my back pocket sometimes because as I walk and say, what, what, what are you doing with that? Uh, pastor needs it. Oh, okay, no problem. When I was a kid, it was dad. I had the dad card in my pocket. Dad would tell me, go get this and I'd be running through the house, going through stuff and somebody would say, what are you doing? Usually it was one of my sisters picking on me, trying to get me in trouble. What are, you, what are you in dad's stuff for? Dad told me to get it. Oh. Get that little card, put it in a pocket. So when Jesus says, tell him our mass, the Lord needs it, it's like the Lord card. Nothing beats that one. But one of the things I want to take a moment and talk about is, this is interesting, when I was reading the story, I read it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is the one I thought would be best applicable for what we're going through today. Uh, but they, in Matthew, he talks about go and you'll see a colt. You'll see a donkey and a young colt. So there's two animals. You'll know the young colt because the mother will be right there. And something I read regarding that that I thought was pretty interesting is no colt was ever taken off without the mother for its first ride. They always brought the mother along for its first ride so that 
it would keep the cult calm. Kind of like parents when they go to teach their kids to ride a bike. You don't just hand them a bike and say, go. You walk with them. You hold the back. And the kids who are learning, they always say this. Uh, is he, are, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go. And then, and then you're, you're yelling them, look forward, look forward, look forward. Why? So you can let go. But I find it interesting. They know that this cult has never been ridden because the mom is still there. I don't know what else that has scripturally, but to me, I think it's pretty powerful that they would know that the cult had never been ridden. And you don't hear him say, also bring the mother. You know, scripture says that Jesus is looking for a pure, spotless bride. We are only able to be that bride through his blood. So he's looking for us. Now I could go into a whole revelation thing of how he took two he sent two disciples ahead, and there's the two witnesses, and I could probably connect enough dots to confuse you all about who Jesus is, so I'm not going to do that. I can tell you, it says, if anyone, <laughs> I love this, if anyone asks, why are you untying that cult? Just say the Lord needs it. So they went, in verse 32, they went and found the cult just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they are untying it, the owners ask them, why are you untying the colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Now I want to pause here for a moment. I want you to think about this. Number one, he said, go here and do that. It's that simple. How many times have you told somebody, can you go get this from my room I think it's either here or it's here or it's here because you're not really sure of where anything is. They were able to walk up and be like, uh, are we, sh you know, I kind of would like to think they had a little bit of a conversation. How are we going to know this cult? I don't know. How are we going to oh, look, look, there's one right there. It's exactly what he said. Well, what if they yell at us? Well, we know what to say. We got that little card in my back pocket. And I love how the people were just so eager to be like, oh, the Lord needs it? Okay, no problem. They didn't challenge it. Sometimes God tells you to do something and we go, wait a minute, God, I don't get it. I don't understand that. Wait a minute, God, that's not exactly what I would do. Hold on a second, God. This is how we do things. But yet, he gave us the instructions. He just wants you to obey it. That's simple. So they threw garments over it for him to ride on. And as he rode along, the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing and walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they've seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. People are up there with their palm branches and they're waving their arms and they're throwing their coats on the ground and come on, we love this. Jesus, Hosanna, blessings to the king. And the Pharisees are kind of upset. Jesus, and, and this is my favorite part. He's riding, the parade's happening, things are wonderful. And they've, sh they've either walked, I kind of like to think this is what they did. There's nothing scriptural to back me up, but just hear me on this. Everybody's shouting. They would have to shout louder than the crowd, which they may not have been able to do. Then they push through the crowd. I like to think that one of them may have even walked onto the coats in the path. Hey, as he's coming by, hey, Jesus, take care of this. They're saying things that aren't right. They're doing things that I don't like. Take care of it. 
And God love this is Jesus' answer. <laughs> he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the world were, excuse me, road would burst into cheers. If they kept quiet, the stones would begin to praise him. If they kept quiet, the stones would begin to say the exact same thing. You know, one of my favorite things about God and one of the things that also irritates me about God, I'm allowed to be irritated, that doesn't make me right, that makes me wrong, but that doesn't mean I, have to, I enjoy every second of it. One of the things that always irritates me is God sometimes will answer a question with a question. God, is this something I should do? Do you think you should do it? That's what I just asked you. Have you ever been there? I'm the only one. Some of you are like, never. Everything God tells me, I take wholeheartedly and I have no problem with it whatsoever. Sorry. Guess you're all holier than that. No, I'm just kidding. So often we get upset about it. I, I can tell you last night uh, we sat down to dinner and my son Isaac came to sit down and we were having some leftovers. There was a chick, leftover chicken fettuccine Alfredo uh, that my wife had had and she put some on my son Isaac's plate and goes, hey, here's dinner. And he looks at it and goes, what is this? Now, I'm just letting you know, I am in no way, shape, or form do I believe that you should starve children. But I have a philosophy when it comes to kids not eating. They're just not hungry enough yet. And so my thought is this. If you wait long enough, that'll start to look really good. And so I was determined, we're going to sit here and wait. And sure enough, he ate every little bit of it. Ate every bite. No problems, no hollering, no nothing. And I remember sitting there thinking, hmm, how many times we had to do that with that boy? And if you, your children ate everything, now my boys are really good eaters, but every once in a while you come across that one thing where you're like, they're like, mm -mm, nope. And I'm like, I will wait you out. And you will eat it eventually. Because I grew up in the house where if you didn't eat it for dinner, then it became your breakfast. And if you didn't eat it for breakfast, it became your lunch. And if you didn't eat it for lunch, guess what you had for dinner the next night? You see, sometimes God's waiting on us to follow. And I love this. The Pharisees are hollering at Jesus. Hey, there, just, just tell them to be quiet because you know what they're saying is wrong. And in a phrase of Jesus saying, if they kept quiet, the stones would cheer up. The stones would cry out. He's literally telling them, number one, they're not wrong. I am the son of God. Number two, I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Can I tell you, if you read scripture anywhere, they talk about this Messiah, how he's coming and they're so excited and the prophecy is happening. These guys knew Je Zechariah 9.9. They could have easily been like, oh, this is it. It's prophecy being fulfilled. Can I tell you, this is probably my most favorite part. Part of the reason the Pharisees and the people of the day were upset with Jesus was because they expected a Messiah to come in and overthrow their oppressors. To raise up an army. To come into the city triumphantly. Nobody was expecting a baby born in Bethlehem, even though that's what Scripture had prophesied. Nobody was expecting Jesus to just heal everybody. They were expecting him to rule. They were expecting a King David to come again, to make their country great. And here's the sad part. A big parade, a triumphant entry, Jesus gave them that. And they turned their nose up at him. Jesus tried to meet every single person where they were at. And the sad part is, is even the Pharisees, when they got what they wanted, turned their back on him. 
Scripture is very clear that after that, they begin to plot on killing Jesus and even Lazarus because a lot of people came to know Jesus because of raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, here's the best part. You heard me talk about how I said, I've, you know, the cult and we're that spotless bride. You have the donkey who could have messed up in that situation. The donkey could have thought it was all about him or her. I don't know which donkey it was. But I can tell you that donkey, I mean, think about it. I'm walking along. Look at this. I, I don't even have to touch the ground. They're laying coats down in front of me. They're waving. They're shouting. Hee-haw. I don't even know what's going on. This is so great. They love me. But you see, the cult's job was not to absorb the praise. The cult's job was to bring the master to the people. See, our job is to do that. God's used donkeys all throughout Scripture. It was a donkey that carried, Mary, brought Jesus to Bethlehem initially inside Mary. One of my favorite stories is Balaam's donkey. The donkey of an unbeliever on his way to curse Israel. And the, God causes the donkey to talk to him. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? And the donkey says, why do you keep beating me? Because the donkey saw the angel. Can I tell you, our job is to bring the master to the city. Our job is to praise his name the entire time. Because if we are quiet, the rocks will cry out. And I don't, I say this very cautiously. Here in Western Maryland, there's a lot of rocks. There's a lot of rocks. We, some of them are mountains, some of them are boulders, some of them are shale beds. I don't think God's any particular respecter of any type of rock, but I can tell you this. That if we are quiet, I don't want to be around when the rocks decide to cry out. So I will tell you, as I close today, we need to be ready to receive God. We need to have our palm branches ready, not necessarily these, but spiritually speaking. We need to be ready to worship him. We need to be ready to call out his name and declare Hosanna. We need to be de ready to declare he's the king. We need to be ready to tell people he's the savior. He's the promised Messiah. There used to be a song that I would sing in church um, back in 19... And the bridge would basically say, there ain't gonna, I'm not, I ain't gonna let no rock outpraise me. I ain't gonna let no tree stand in my way. And no, we're not going to sing that song today. I know some of you might be thinking, wow, Pastor Pete, he even knows the song. No, nope. because I didn't prepare enough to get that to Brother Ricky in time. However, as a matter of fact, I just thought of, remembered the song just now, so that tells you something. But I can tell you this, that is a, that's something that I'm going to be doing throughout this week. Can I tell you, Easter Sunday, next weekend, is the number one attended church service in the world. More people attend Easter than any other service. Do you know what number two is? Mother's Day. Mother's Day beats Christmas. Thank you, moms. Dads, we got to talk. And just so that we're all clear, next week, 10 a.m. is when church starts, okay? We're all together, 10 a.m. I've got one more service to say, 10 a.m., so 10 a.m. I'm not even going to say what time the next service is today because I don't want to mess it up and say that time because then they'll all show up late. But 10 a.m., 
all together again, shouting Hosanna, praising him. We have to be ready to receive him. Every head bow, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we, we sing and we shout Hosanna today. This is your day, Lord. This is your day. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. I will say of you, Lord, that you are my refuge. You are my mighty fortress. You are in whom I trust and have my being, God. You are who I live for. You are who I love more than anything. Today, you might be sitting there saying, you know what, Pastor Pete, that's fine, but I've... I've kind of given place for rocks to cry out. God hasn't shown up in my life the way I expected him to. I thought things were going to turn out differently. You want to know the best part is God is not mad at you. He's not upset with you. And he's also not surprised by it. His grace, his mercy is still there. My scripture says that my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We were talking about the mountains and how he'll move the mountains. I love in Psalms where it says, I don't look to the mountains for my help. For where does my help come from? The maker of heaven and earth, the one who created and put the mountains where they are. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We worship you today. We shout Hosanna in the highest. God, you are worthy. God, you are so worthy. Today for the altar call, I'm going to invite you all to take your palm branches and make your way towards this altar. There's nothing special about these steps or this little bump out or the, the stone here. The altar is just a place where you can go and meet God. And I will tell you that when you physically take the steps, when you physically take that step out, to acknowledge what is going on in you spiritually. Things change. Things happen. So I'm going to encourage you to right now get up on your feet, grab your palm branch if you got it. If you don't, split it in half and give one to the person who doesn't. And make your way here. If you need to get your masks on, get your masks on. I'm going to ask if you could spread out a little bit. I feel like we've got enough people for that. If you feel uncomfortable and just say, no, I need to stay at my seat. That's the beauty of the altar. It's where you make it. But we're going to worship God today as a people. This place has become the altar today. As Brother Ricky leads us in this song, I would encourage you to worship like never before. Sing and shout Hosanna if you need to, because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.